The title of our film is Almost There, and my name is Dan Rabicki. I am one of the co-director, co-producers, and uh, I. this is the first film that I've made, and I'm also a film professor in Chicago, so I guess that's my day job, or the job that I do alongside making this film, which we've been working on for eight years. Are you also a photographer? I dabble in photography, so dabble? yeah, I'm, I'm definitely someone who has taken quite a bit of photographs. I'm Aaron Wickenden. I am also co-director on Almost There and a producer. Um, I edited the film, and Dan did the, the writing on the film. Um, and I did the cinematography for the film. I have a, I'm primarily known in terms of the documentary scene as, as a documentary editor. Uh, edited Finding Vivian Meyer, The Interrupters, Trials of Muhammad Ali, Scrappers, a number of other projects. I've been um, working actively as a documentary filmmaker since 2001. And you're both a part of the cartoon. Is that the way you say it? Cartel. Like, cartel. Uh, cartel. Cartel. Quinn. <laughs> the, cartoon, the cartoon cartel. Um, cartel Quinn Films, which is yeah. a super respected documentary company that's been making documentaries yeah. for almost 50 years now. We're coming up to our yeah, 50th, 50th year, year anniversary. In 2016. 16. I think. Yeah. Um, so, cartel Quinn, you know, is known for uh, right. making hoop dreams. Um, and you know, most recently, Life Itself, which is out this year. And then a few films in the Cartumplin canon that were extremely influential on our film, uh, which would be Home for Life, the first, I think, credited um, Cartumplin film, which is about um, the process of a senior couple moving into a senior home and documenting their tra that transition for them. Um, Golub, a film about uh, Leon Golub that was directed by uh, Jerry Blumenthal, who passed away um, last week. And, and, uh, Stevie. Uh, and Stevie. And Stevie, which I believe you brought yes, up and is completely appropriate yeah. and, and some film that we really looked so at. This is a yeah. Chicago-based film collective, is that correct? Yes. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah. I, I thought it started with Steve James, uh, who I think is America's greatest uh, living documentary filmmaker. I'm with and, you there. and there's a couple of other people here, here. that are right there with them, uh, like the Maisels, etc., yes. and Penny Baker, but I think that the, 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 there's a particular character to his films uh, and I would assume to this collector's films, which I saw in the work of, of the film that we're going to talk about. Now, is it true that you spent eight years making this film? Yeah, I mean, you know, when you, when you, you know, definitely that the film was made over eight years, but it's not like every single day we did nothing but devote ourselves to the project. I mean, I guess we were thinking But about I would it. say There's that... There's never a moment know, we, that goes by where we're not thinking about it. Right, and we met the subject in 2006, and I think the first two years was, you know, very much just corresponding and sort of visiting him at a pierogi festival and photographing him. But starting in 2008, when we visited his home, I would say that we have worked very steadily That's for true. these past six years. All right, so let, yeah. let's talk a little bit about the subject. His name is Peter. His name is Peter. He Anton. is uh, a, an elder, a senior, Currently an old man, old, and yeah. an artist, and a weirdo. <laughs> sure. <laughs> eccentric. Sure. Just like eccentric. Us. And, yeah. and in the art world, that is called outsider art. Correct. But, so how did you find him, and why were you interested in his particular story? Well, I, I will say how we found him, which is that we went uh, outside of Chicago. There's a uh, festival called Pierogi Fest, where um, we went to see the world's largest pierogi and to eat a lot of pierogies. I grew up, I'm Ukrainian and Polish, and uh, my grandmother used to make pierogies for the church. And so we, we, you know, we went out to see the pierogies and meet Mr. Pierogi. Um, and then we, you know, sort of went off of a beaten path, and there at a rickety old table was this rickety old man doing pastel portraits of children yeah and, and what, is yeah. that this you shoot something like that is yeah. in the film yeah. is that was the first time you shot him no well actually no so that's that's a construction that we put together okay. in the editing room to give you that the audience that it's sense of discovery well, let's so, talk a minute about construction in yeah. a documentary okay let's do it I, you know that uh, is it a trick um, when you, when the audience doesn't know, like I thought you had shot there, I believe right. that I just didn't even think about it. Yeah. And uh, and now that I, that I heard that's the first time you met him, I thought, yeah. oh wow, you had your camera out at that right. point. But from a filmmaker point of view, from a documentary point of view, from an ethical point of view, right. the the role of construction, I can think of a number of documentaries which I hated because the construction right. was not valid. Right. So how did you come to decision to construct and and why? 
Well, the, the film launches, uh, the sort of inciting incident is our meeting with, with Peter. Um, when, when we actually met him, we did have our cameras there. We were doing a lot of still photography, so that's a big part of those op opening sequences. Um, but we wanted to, to bring the audience in and allow them that same sort of sense of discovery that we were having. And that was going on, you know, in the years that followed. There were, there were so many layers to Peter that, you know, the the discovery process continues still. So, you know, it didn't seem it didn't seem unethical to take footage from, you know, the second year when we were there, um, when we still didn't really know the end result of what it would be used for, capture a lot of footage around Pierogi Fest and the event, and then incorporate that with the photos to sort of tell the story of our meeting. Yes. So, I mean, there's definitely cases where, where construction or manipulation would feel wrong, but this this felt this I think at the Stonewall documentary where they had a lot of fake construction of things that didn't happen right, for right. example this yeah. all did yeah, happen we, we never it just asked happened them. in a different year yeah and, and all that the footage that is in that see it's no, nothing where we were directing him to do this or that so that it would fit into the film in a certain kind of way it was all kind of verite footage but just from the second year how many so, hours did you actually shoot you know, we never totaled it because it was all on a DSLR, and so you know you're just shooting to clips and you know socking. So there were small cam there were small cameras. Uh, like primarily a Canon 5D Mark II, okay. um, and we got it. 7D. Yeah, in a 7D, we we got the camera right when it came out. It was the first Canon camera that sort of kicked off the whole DSLR film movement, mm -hmm. and so. Um, we were, you know, no one really knew how to use it to film at that time, so we were kind of figuring that out at the very beginning of the process as well. One of the things is that I found really interesting in the film is that the, 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 there's a lot of secrets in your film that, that old people don't like people to know, right. and people don't do know and don't talk about. Yeah. Clutter is one of them. Yeah. And, 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 and uh, I mean, it's, clutter can be a very serious issue, and it may be a very serious issue with Peter, yeah. but it's also a, a house full of memory and a physical inability to clean or move or thread through. So the audience goes into the house with you, and it's shocking. Shocking, and at one point you're, you're you're wearing masks because you discover mold where he's living, and he's wearing nothing. I figure he has elephant genes, you know, nothing touches so him. So do we. <laughs> we still can't now we got him. <laughs> uh, and but just how you, on a personal level, as filmmakers, but oh, how do I do this? You know, right. how do I um, acknowledge that this is really fucked up, right. quote unquote. Um, and, and yet, this is this is the environment where, where Peter lives and creates. Right. So, so just walk us through that that kind of filmmaker. Well, I mean, I think that uh, oh, it's showing is always better than telling. And there were moments where we tried to describe what our reactions were, but we cut a lot of that VO out and then just kept that shot of us descending into the basement for the first time so people could experience on a visceral and visual level mm -hmm. what we were experiencing. Um, you know, I think the job of a documentarian is to is, you know, mostly bear witness to somebody without judging somebody, although you can see that sometimes I got a little, I crossed the line a couple times, but I don't know if that answers the question, but you know, I think that it was a combination of allowing the audience to experience what we were experiencing, mm -hmm. and then you know, trying to keep the humor up because we never tried to, you know, we, Peter spoke about our subject, you know, was very lighthearted about the situation, so we didn't want to make it, right. you know, we didn't want to make it a big deal if he wasn't making it. It, a it big was deal. interesting to me; he had absolutely no shame of the condition of the house mm -hmm. or how he lived, which is really unusual. Most mm -hmm. seniors that I know who have clutter issues, mm -hmm. uh, won't let you into their apartment, the Department of, 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 of Services that has to go and protect them, they, they don't want them to let them in, um, and yet he, he just, it was like he was very comfortable. Well, I think part of, part of that's, you know, um, one of the characters in the film, Dan McKern, who's Peter's friend for 30 years, says, you know, he, Peter is basically living as a recluse. He, you know, um, is in that house and he doesn't see anybody for a whole month. So he's alone. And so just, just having company, having, you know, and he was, he was so obsessed with telling his story that just having us there and us having the capabilities to do that um, was so was extremely fulfilling for him and probably helped overcome what you're talking about in terms of the shame of the clutter. One of the things that, that is uh, very challenging in the film 
uh, to your credit, is that the perception of someone who's different, mm -hmm. and not just marking them off as crazy, mm -hmm. um, but you know the Chinese. You know, I, I remember reading uh, about after Mao took over and how the. I was interested in the mental how they dealt with mental health issues, and they used to put all the villagers in a circle and tell them to to say bitter truth. And what and the crazy person or the person that seemed to be irrational, they would always listen for what the critique was, what the what the real truth was, underneath of, of all the stuff that was off putting. And I thought that 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 was, I don't know whether consciously or not, and this may be part of the editing process. Mm -hmm. You gave great dignity to Peter's differentness and to his ability to express himself in a uh, critical way. Right. Like, I think. It, uh, no, I mean, I think, thank you. I think that's really a compliment we appreciate because that was maybe the hardest part and what took the edit so long was finding a way to modulate so people didn't feel that Peter was being exploited, making sure also that we were really interested in the collaborations, obviously, between a subject and a filmmaker. And so, you know, Peter's narration, is sort of his POV duels with ours quite a bit throughout the film. And in fact, the opening of the film is from Peter's perspective. And we felt like that was a great way to bring you into Peter's world, to not make him the outsider, which is what often happens in documentaries about these sorts of characters, which is it's told from the top down. Right. And so Peter, in a way, has an agency in the film. And he speaks for himself. And that was super Super important to us, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> the, well the, 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 um, you know, ever since Michael Moore, the, the 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 documentaries many times, particularly the younger they are, it seems, is about the documentary filmmaker. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed with the way you navigated both putting yourself mainly Ben. I don't remember you at all. Pop up. Pop up. Pop up. He says I, a couple I, words here you, and there. You, you <laughs> pop up in, in visual. I mean, yes. in, when he paints you, and you're, you're always present. But yeah. Ben is very yeah. more yeah. present. Yeah. Yeah. And and yet, it wasn't. It was. You didn't dominate the narrative in the way so many yeah. of these first-person documentaries do, and the subject becomes less important than how the subjectivity of the documentary filmmaker. How did you negotiate that amongst yourselves and making that choice of putting yourself in the film, and how, uh, and, and, and when you pull back from it, you know, making making the subject the, the, the subject of the film? You know, I think if, if I'll start and sure. then I think um, so, so when we started, you know, because Peter spends so much time as a solitary, there was this just, you know, there was, it was almost impossible to just film him doing something without him wanting to interact. Like the interaction was so important to him. Like, you know, and you see that throughout the film. You see that when, you know, uh, where it winds up at the end of the film. That ultimately, at his core, he just he loves people and wants to be around people and interact with them. And so, you know. The idea of us just being able to go in and kind of film his daily life and his rituals, we, there's some of that in the movie, but, um, you know, he was constantly talking to us. And we, we even tried, we're like, Peter, can, can, you, can you, you know, we're just going to film you doing this thing for a little while, and he would start sighing, and he would get kind of bored with that approach. And so, you know, Dan is, is very, you know, active and engaging, and so, you know, Dan and Peter just started developing this rapport that was very... Um, friendly, it was on like an even playing field, um, it was from respect, and uh, and so I think, you know, because I was shooting it, I would just capture that kind of interchange um, on occasion. I think Peter also, we feel like we set out to tell his story, mm -hmm. and in some ways we feel that we became supporting characters in his story, and we had to acknowledge that, that, you know, at a certain time in his life, we were the ones mm -hmm. that were helping him, and so we don't dominate the story. We literally are supporting characters right. in Peter's story. Right. But what you did, which I, I think is quite remarkable, is that because he touched you, it also triggered memories of your own family situation, sure. um, which is uh, which I think is what usually happens with an audience if they're really watching and the film is successful. It makes them think about things larger than just what they've seen on the screen. But you also include that in the film, yes. and I would like to Ben in particular talk a little bit about making the decision to reference what it triggered in you, and we see that visually. It's not so much talked about. We go and visit your family. 
Um, just talk a little bit about, about that. Sure. I mean, you know, I think that as a teacher, I teach documentary at a college in Chicago, and I think, first of all, my students are always wondering, who are the people behind the camera, and what motivates them, and who are they just to put a camera on people? Why are they making this film? And Good questions. it's almost, you know, and so, you know, and so I often think, even just in my own life, the things that we're making or, or obsessed with in our present are, are ways of working out something that still haunts us from our past. And so I felt in this particular film, when people were asking us, why are you spending so many years working with this man? It triggered for me, like, well, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. There are connections, mm -hmm. and let's explore those connections, because I miss seeing those connections mm -hmm. in a lot of films. Mm -hmm. Like, there are a lot of films that it doesn't seem appropriate for a filmmaker to be in, but there are some where I really want to know, mm -hmm. why is it? And I felt like it was important to show that, because I don't see that enough. See, that's why it made me think of Stevie, because yes. when, when Steve James went back after a number of years and, and began to, to be self-critical yes. and look at what was what role did I play here as a documentary filmmaker? What role did I play here as a human being? Definitely. Because that's the same questions that I, I would assume... And we have to say, you know, Steve James is, a, you know, a big mentor. Um, Aaron yeah. has obviously edited the interrupters with Steve. Steve is a very strong part of Cartempoint. And between him and Gordon Quinn, the ethical conversations we were able to have, particularly with Stevie as our base, was extremely helpful during the post process in the edit. Especially being filmmakers who are present in your own film. It's it's you know and, and we edited it together. So it's like you, you can get lost in all that really easily. Um, and and this might so be where two are a, better than one too. Yeah, we could yeah. at least not just one you know and we, we could bounce it off. And we screened it over and over and over yeah. again, you know, more than I've done with any other documentary and we would just pull people in at every phase just to make sure that we weren't getting lost in our storytelling. Yes. That's a question of trust too, because this collective of filmmakers actually respects and trusts each other. Yes. I mean, yes, that, that, they do. You, what you're saying makes that very clear. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that that, that uh, also I found really interesting, I don't remember a social worker, I don't remember an administrator, I don't remember the Department of Aging, or any of those talking heads, which usually sort of directs how we're supposed to see this subject, are in the film. But there are people in the film, but they're not the traditional talking head types. How did you make that? At what point did you make that decision? Well, from the from the beginning, you know, because Peter was living in this isolated condition, you know, he had had a really traumatic experience in 2005, where social workers kind of came to his house. They said, "Hey, we're we're going to fix up your house for you. Um, why don't we put you in the shelter for a couple of days? The house will be great. And we'll move you back in." And uh, according to Peter, it was basically a ploy to get him out. You know, um, probably rightfully so. At that time, it was probably still really you know starting to be terrible so they moved him into a homeless shelter and he's like I have a home and that's where all my memories are so he he just didn't wanted nothing to do with any social service agency so there he wasn't really actively involved in any we tried to present him with information you know places that would give him shelter places that might come and fix up the house and he had just had such bad experiences he didn't want anything to do with it over the film as the film goes on you see him start to deal I think with the systems a little bit more. And just, yeah, I guess additionally I think that we were interested in the caretakers who aren't professional caretakers. They exist in every family, in every community. There are people who are compelled to take care of seniors and people, elderly people at risk. And so those people's stories don't necessarily always get told and they're not supposedly the pros, but they're dealing with these very powerful issues. So. It made me think of the interrupters. Because right. uh, again, they're, they're their own interrupters. <laughs> yeah, yes. in, in, in the interrupters, you have community people mm -hmm. that have experienced the trauma or the or, or whatever word is proper about what happens in that urban poverty yeah. environment mm -hmm. uh, of gangs and try to intervene in a way that the cops and the professionals cannot do. I, it's, uh, so I, you know, I, I just was. There's three. I think I'm going to remember. Maybe the number is wrong, but three yeah. people that somehow. Peter snares, seduces, and manipulates, including yourselves, right. into caring about him. Yeah. When and the, the, you know most people would look away or go, oh my god, I can't or whatever, right. and they're pretty, you know, the the, the the friend for thirty years and his wife, right. and each of the of the people seems to reach a point where they go, wait a minute, Peter, yeah. and I I want to know that moment for the two of you. Oh. Wait a minute, Peter. No, you know. Well, 
I think it's the moment in the film when I say, when he calls me and says, can you get me a commode for my house? And I'm like, Peter, I'm not the guy who can buy you a commode. I mean, yeah. it has come to this, like, you know, I can bring you some Pringles. Yeah. I can get you some stuff. But now you're asking for things right. that we, we're not here to give. Yeah. And he also, the whole experience with what happened during the exhibit, the secret that is revealed, was complicated for us. And we wondered maybe yes. we were too trusting of this person. Yeah, is that... yeah definitely. Um... Yes, there is a secret in the film, and we're not going to talk about it right. because you need to go see it because it's, it's placed in a particular moment in the film yeah. which allows you to really look at it in a complete So I think at that moment, yeah. we really did feel like, well, yeah. maybe we trusted too much. Maybe we let right. our guard down too, too, too much. And, you know, we were so d deep into the filming at that point that we brought the camera, we just brought it, and, and, and you know, I wasn't really even actively looking through the viewfinder all that often during that, some, some of the more intense mo moments of the film. Yeah. There's another moment that I found really intriguing. I want you to help me. Yeah. There was this woman that runs a gallery space Cleo called Wilson. Intuit. Yeah. Uh, that, and she was having. She described what an outsider, what outsider art is. Yeah. Can, do you remember what, what she said? Sure. Okay. It's uh, you know, outsider art is people who are creating art outside of the cultural and commercial mainstream. That is sort of the definition of outsider art, is the people, the who, in a sense, yeah, that are compelled to make art and are working outside of the commercial and cultural right. mainstream. So for so Peter, how he fits into that is that he, he he's compulsion to tell his life story and to make sure he has ownership of the way that his, his story is told. Um, caught, you know, is one of the reasons that he's making all the art that he makes. Um, it's not that he wants to make this scrapbook and then or painting and then sell it for thousands of dollars. In fact, you know, along the way, you know, we would buy a painting and then just give it back to him ultimately because he wanted it in his house and his career. In fact, when he had a painting in the show at Intuit, he repainted the painting to keep in his home for himself so he could have his heart with him. Yeah. Well, see, that's where the mental health issue comes in. Right. Yeah. And I thought that giving the respect to uh, a person who's different, who has mental health issues, but is functioning, mm -hmm. and certainly functioning creatively, yes. is uh, a, a very important lesson in the well, film. Well, this started out as a photography project. We showed pic pic photographs to people, and people said, is he ill? Mm -hmm. And we said, well, geez, you know, he's pretty articulate, and he, why don't we just start videoing him? And we put little clips in our exhibit because we were like, let him speak for himself. He's, mm -hmm. you tell us what you think he mm -hmm. is, you know? Yeah. Uh, at first I thought, well, maybe he's autistic. But then I thought, no, I don't think he's even a high functioning autistic because he actually has a lot, a very active emotional <coughs> life. In the, in the film, True. which is one of the, the things that distinguishes that kind of. In yeah. template for explaining someone's behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the show, there's a very tender moment for me when I don't know who is washing him and spiffing him up to go to the, to the opening, sure. but he is so unaware that there's grime on his feet uh, and that his dirty, sort of stained clothes. Um, I don't know if he wears depends or not, but I rather doubt it. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know, depends. <laughs> and, 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 and we get none of that judgment from the film. You know, right. I mean, the audience is left to figure out how they feel about this. Right. Yes. But someone who cleans them up, first of all. Oh, now. No, oh, you mean now? No, no, no. Time. Who cleaned him up in the film? But then oh, a there was a, a local doctor, Dr. Jimenez, who's in uh, East Chicago, Indiana. Fantastic guy, never charges him. I mean, he basically runs this office. People can come in, and he kind of does it from the kindness of his heart. He's known Peter for a long and time. And Peter okay. once painted a religious painting for him that okay. he kept, you know. So yeah. Peter trusts him. Oh, and yeah. he doesn't judge oh, yeah. Peter, but it, it was oh. very it was very sweet for me yeah. that they made him ready for his opening. Yeah. You know? yeah. <laughs> and of course, he he immediately, almost immediately, went back to his old ways of living. <laughs> yes, he did. We <laughs> but tried he it. But he rose to the moment. Yes, he, he did. did. Bow tie um, and all. I, I, you know, I would love to sit here and talk for a couple of hours with the both of you, and I know that you're very busy and. Uh, so we're going to bring it to a close. I just would like to um, give you the opportunity to say to people who listen to this and uh, who, who hopefully why they should come and see your film and what you learned 
-hmm. from your experience with Peter mm -hmm. as human beings and as, as filmmakers? Wow. Um, well, I think our film, you know, definitely gives you the portrait of a living artist working in his environment, and I think Peter, in many ways, is a representative of a lot of artists, not the art stars that we see in big films, but artists who work in their communities throughout the world, unsung, uncelebrated, and sometimes marginalized, and I think every community has an eccentric like this, so we feel really grateful that we were able to spend eight years really seeing what an artist is like, and I think you'll see that in the film. A poor artist. A poor artist, like many artists. <laughs> um, and uh, and also, I think our film really is a meditation on the hows and whys of people, why people help other people, and, and you know who gets what from the helping. Uh, yeah. And as for what we've learned, yeah, I mean, you know, Peter, Peter's um, thing that he told us right out of the gate. Uh, what he hoped for out of the film was that it would be a portrait of perseverance. And he kind of yeah, identified yeah. that for himself as fortitude, fortitude, right? yeah, fortitude and perseverance. And those, I think he, he knew that those were his, his sort of, you know, crowning characteristics. And, um, you know, he, his goal was that people who saw the film would know um, that no matter what obstacles they had in their lives, that they would be able to overcome them. So he helped, but you know, he was hoping that by sharing the story, people would feel inspired. That that you know, he, the, the the extremes of the pain that he was in, um, you know, hopefully people would see that and think, whatever struggles I'm having, I, I can wind up on the other side too, and things can I can let go of my past. And you know what? It's a funny film. It's After a lot, everything it's we've funny. said, it's a funny film. Oh yes, it is. Right, funny. have a good I mean, time. <laughs> well, e either you take it very seriously, which yeah. would be awful, right. <laughs> horrible, yeah. or you understand the human humor right. in the film, which is how yes. people get through life. Which you is know? how we took Peter. Yeah, that's how Peter gets through life, and we wanted to. Celebrate and I, that. I also uh, just two tiny little questions should be. Um, you also acknowledge his physical disabilities, and as he aged over the years, that that he had physical problems that did not destroy his spirit or his output at all, but that that reality was something that both of you had to deal with as filmmakers. Yes, I mean, I think that it was would have been hard to make this film without another person because there are a lot of moments where even in the transportation someone would have to help Peter right. into the car while someone else was had a camera and held my boom or you know I mean so in that way I think it was really helpful that we were both there and um, how, how did you decide to end the film because I'm sure that Peter would have kept you there for, until the day, <laughs> uh, you know, we're forever. Still <laughs> yeah, we're still. It's not very easy to end a documentary. It just we felt it though. Yeah, we did feel it. We, we had what we, we you know. I come from a screenwriting and playwriting background, mm -hmm. and I think that when you work this long, yeah. you start to see yeah. the shape of a, a story. And we, we, where we ended it, felt like yeah. the place to end I mean, it. The essential arc is like: Is Peter going to be able to let go of his past? Is he going to be able to leave his home? Is he going to get out of the situation? And I think once we land in that place and figure out if he can sustain it and how is this changing him, the movie felt like well, it was... Well, I hope that you get the distribution of the film, but, but secretly I hope that it shows on public television, which is free, mm -hmm. and that, that large amounts of people that may not go to a commercial screening of it will be able to see it because it's such a, such an American story yeah, it's such it also says something about American people that we don't hear about too much you know uh, I, I do believe you give people enough information at the core they're good people and they're kind people and uh, and that's so much a product of what of how you approach Peter with respect and dignity and share with us the audience this very strange incredible artist who's an old man in dire states, and he doesn't care. That's right. Thank, Thank you. you.